Hi, and welcome back. Our next speaker, in true hacker fashion, takes things apart to put them back together again. He's revived and restored historically important computers, ranging from a Xerox Alto to an old tube IBM. To top everything off, he also likes to look deep inside silicon. And today, he'll be taking us on some of his silicon spelunking adventures. Please join me in welcoming to the Hack of the Day Supercon stage, Ken Sheriff. Hi, everyone. So I'm here to talk about how you can take apart chips yourself, look inside, and find out what's going on. So anyone here ever use a 555 timer? <laughs> All right. It, at one point, it was the, the most popular chip in the world, they say. So if you want to take it apart, the easy thing is to um, get a copy that's in a metal case like this, which you can get off eBay. Then you can take a jeweler's saw, or if you don't have one, just a plain hacksaw, and you can cut off the top of the chip, and you can see the die. So you can see the tiny silicon die with bond wires connected to the pins. So now we can put it under a microscope, and we can see the chip in more detail. So what you're looking at here, um, these, these yellowish traces, that's the metal layer on top of the chip that wires everything together. And then underneath, um, purplish in this picture, is the actual silicon. And you can see subtle color changes where the silicon has been doped with chemicals to give it different semiconductor properties, uh, making N-type silicon and P-type silicon. So now I'll step back and talk a little bit about transistors, which are like the key point of integrated circuits. They function as switches and amplifiers. Um, for an NPN transistor, you have an N layer for the, the collector, a P layer for the base, and then another N layer for the emitter. Seems straightforward enough, but when you look on an actual chip, it looks totally different. You have the, all these weird things. The base usually isn't in the middle of the transistor. Sometimes you've got six collectors. Sometimes you've got two emitters. It's like this crazy world of transistors on an integrated circuit. But doing all these things, it's OK on an integrated circuit. So now looking at an NPN transistor from the 555 timer, we can see the metal layer. Um, we can see the wires connected to the collector, the emitter, and the base. Um, we can see some faint lines that show where different regions of diffusion have been, have been done. Now, it makes more sense if we look at it in cross-section. Um, you can see the, the N and P layers. Um, now, if you want to recognize one of these, these transistors on an integrated circuit, there's a few tricks you can use. So you, usually, the emitter has a sort of square region, which I've marked in a red box. Um, the base has a rectangular region that surrounds the emitter, and then the collector is kind of off on its own. So using these tricks, you can start to recognize the, the transistors when you see them on the, on the chip. And if you look here, you can see there is actually NPN structure sort of buried inside this complex transistor. Now, the, the transistor is made by um, applying different chemicals to diffuse into the silicon. Um, Sam's talk later will probably go into more details of how that actually happens. So now you might think a PNP transistor would just be the opposite of an NPN, but it turns out it has a totally different structure for semiconductor reasons. It has a circular structure. You have a small um, circle for the emitter, which is surrounded by a larger ring for the, for the base, and then that's surrounded by the collector. And you can see that the base wire goes, the base contact sort of connects underneath to get to that, that central ring. And again, here you can look and you see there is a PNP structure hidden inside this, this fairly complex structure. Now, resistors are another important part of integrated circuits. Um, they're made with a narrow strip of doped silicon. Uh, it's connected to metal layers at the end. Um, zooming out, we can see more resistors. There's a large U-shaped one at the top. There's a long one here. Now, the important thing about resistors is that they're pretty big and inaccurate and kind of inconvenient to put on integrated circuits. So designers usually try to avoid them and use transistors instead. So it's kind of backwards compared to discrete components where you think of resistors as being free and transistors as something you try to minimize. So now, now that we've looked at the transistors and resistors, you should be able to find some of them on the, on the 555 chip here. So the way the 555 works is it charges and discharges a capacitor through a resistor, and that gives you your timing and your oscillations. So up at the top, you can see in red a comparator. Those are the round PNP transistors. 
So that puts it into the charging mode when the voltage reaches the right level. And down at the bottom, you can see another comparator with, uh, with the rectangular NPN transistors, and that switches it out of charging mode. Um, you can see there's marked in blue three very large transistors. These are ones drive the output pins. They're larger for higher current. And in green, you can see a flip-flop. So now I'll go into more detail on the flip-flop because that's something we're going to see in more ICs later. So you can see the two NPN transistors. We can, we can pick out the base, the emitter, and the collector. We can see how they're wired up in the metal layer. And we can have a simple schematic here. Now the interesting thing about this circuit is when one transistor is turned on, it tur forces the base of the other one to be off. So it can be stable either in this way or in the mirror image. So either transistor can be on and it will remember either a zero or a one. So now I'd like to talk a bit about the, the microscope I use. So the, the microscope, um, if you use a normal, if a normal microscope, the light shines from below up through, the, up through the sample, which works well if you have a cell, but not so well if you have a, you know, a chip which is opaque. So instead what you want, it's called a metallurgical microscope. Here the light shines from above, gets focused down through the lens, so you get a bright spot on the surface. And that's how you can see the dye in high detail. So you'll notice that there's this light source off to the side looking kind of goofy there, and that's what shines the light down through the microscope. So, so a couple other features that are good to have. Um, a USB camera so you can take pictures, and then an XY stage, which has knobs you can turn to carefully move the die around and take pictures of different parts of the die. So I use um, this program called Hugen, so I can take a bunch of pictures and then stitch them together to get one high resolution image. So um, you can spend a whole lot on microscopes if you want to get really good optics. This is more of an inexpensive one. I waited for a good deal on eBay, and so I got it for about a couple hundred dollars. Now, if you don't have a metallurgical microscope, just a regular microscope, um, you can still see things in chips. It's just not as detailed. So here's what you get if you shine a flashlight down on top of the 741 op amp. You can see a nice reflection of the metal layer, but you can see a lot more if you have a metallurgical microscope. So if you don't have a metallurgical microscope, don't be discouraged. It's fun to open up chips and take a look, um, but you will get more with a, with a light source from the metallurgical microscope. So next, I want to move on to the 74181 ALU chip. Now this chip was used in a lot of the mini computers of the 70s, um, things like the Xerox Alto. It's also a popular chip if people are building um, retro computers, building computers out of TTL. So, some people use the 74181, but some people don't. Um, now if you get a chip in an epoxy package, which is where most chips are packaged, um, you have to dissolve it with um, boiling nitric acid and sulfuric acid. That's just too dangerous for me. So instead what I did is I got a, the ceramic package. It's, it's less common, but you can find a lot of chips in ceramic packages. And you can just take the chip, stick it in a vise, tap it with a chisel, and the ceramic lid just pops right off. So it just takes you a few seconds to decap the chip. So it looks like kind of a mess here. It looks like everything's been destroyed but it's just you know, ceramic dust, and if we blow it off with um, compressed air, then we can get a, a nice dye photo. So here's a photo of the, the ALU chip that I got. Um, and this chip, you know, most of it's taken up with the metal layer, so it's really hard to see the transistors underneath, and that makes it hard to analyze the chip. Um, but I found a way around that. Um, you can actually take the metal layer off with house household chemicals. Um, you know, in industry, they use hydrofluoric acid, which is like super poisonous. Um, but instead, you can get at um, Michael's craft store this um, glass etching cream, which is only moderately poisonous. And <laughs> if you put this on the chip for a few minutes, it will dissolve off the oxide layer, um, the, the glassy layer that protects the chip. And then once you have that dissolved off, you can just take pool acid, put that on the chip for a few minutes, and that dissolves off the metal. So here's what we end up with. Here's the chip with the metal layer, and then here's the chip with the, the metal layer dissolved so we can now see the surface much better. So now if we zoom in on this, um, here is one inverter out of the chip. So you can see the, the NPN transistors. Um, up at the top is the pin for the input. Um, you can 
maybe recognize some resistors around the outside. And there's still a faint trace of the metal, which helps to see how it's wired up. Now, if we label all the, the, um, all the components, here's what we get. So this is a pretty standard TTL inverter circuit, so I won't go into all the details. Um, but the main thing I'd like you to take away from this is that when you're using TTL circuits, you have to have a whole lot of transistors just to do anything like even an inverter. And you see that, you see that the resistors are, are fairly bulky, taking a lot of space up on the, on the chip. Now looking at a different part of the chip, we can see some transistors that have multiple emitters. So he, here you see um, four emitters, the little black dots. Um, a four emitter transistor may seem strange, but it's really just a normal transistor, except it has four emitters. So, so this is used as an AND gate. Um, this doesn't work as an AND gate by itself. You have to combine these transistors with something like the previous inverter, so your, even your AND gate is also pretty large. Um, but we can go through the whole chip like this. Um, up at the top, the red boxes are inverters, like we saw. Um, the blue is the, the AND gates. Um, there's some OR invert gates, which are just similar to the inverters, um, just a little more complex. And then we can draw a schematic, which turns out to be pretty much like you see in the, in the, data, um, in the data book. Now, you might wonder, why is this such a complex chip just to add four bits and do some logic operations? So the main reason is that this chip has carry look ahead. So it, can, so it can do the carries in advance so you don't have to wait for carries to propagate. So it allowed you to do addition fast. So that's, that's why there's all a lot more circuitry than you might expect. So next, I'm gonna move on to a sound effects chip. Now the 76477, it was used in um, video games like Space Invaders. Um, you could also buy it at Radio Shack rest in peace, so it was popular with hobbyists. Uh, it's interesting because it combined analog and digital, and it also didn't use TTL, it used a different technology called integrated injection logic. So here's a die photo that I got from um, Sean Riddle. I'd like to point out that, you know, even if you don't have a microscope, there's tons of die photos out there on the internet. So you can just download some die photos and play the reverse engineering game at home. So anyway, um, in purple, I've marked the analog parts of the chip. There's a super low frequency oscillator, voltage controlled oscillator. Um, those are charging capacitors to resistors. So it's a lot like the 555 timer. Um, in, in cyan, this is the, the digital part of the chip. So that's what I'll talk about in um, a little more detail. So integrated injection logic. So here's a, a transistor. It has one base. It has four collectors, and this implements a NAND gate. So unlike TTL, where you had to have all those transistors, this one transistor gives you a whole NAND gate. Um, the way it works is the base is the input, and then the collectors are multiple outputs. Now, you might wonder, why do you have one input and multiple outputs for a NAND gate? But that's just one of the weird things about integrated injection logic. Um, instead of the bulky resistors that we saw in TTL, we now have this tiny structure called an injector which provides the current it needs. So the key point here is this is much more compact than a, than a TTL gate. So um, a bunch of these are put together on the chip to form a shift register. Um, this is 32 stages. Data comes in, goes through the stages, comes out, and then feedback s sends it back to the input. Now the reason they have this on the sound chip is that they could use it as a nonlinear feedback shift register it generates a pseudo-random sequence, and that sounds like white noise. So basically, this gives you white noise. You can use it for things like gunshots, steam engine explosions, sound effects like that. Now, this is you know, a whole lot more dense than TTL. So in the 1970s, this was like the technology of the future. Integrated injection logic was going to combine the speed of TTL with the high density of MOS. It was going to take over the world. Um, spoiler, it didn't. Um, CMOS came along, CMOS won, and so that's why all your processors today use CMOS and not integrated injection logic. So now I'm going to move on to a, a considerably more complex chip, the Intel 8087. So um, back when the 8086 came along, um, that chip did 16-bit integer mathematics. 
integer operations. So if you want floating point, it was really, really slow. Um, but what you could do is you could get this 8087 chip, you could pop it into your, your IBM PC, and now your floating point was 100 times faster. So it was very useful for scientific um, calculation. Um, this was kind of a revolutionary chip for floating point, and the instructions are still part of the x86 architecture that the computers use today. So again, I got the ceramic chip so I could just pop the lid off. You can see the die. I took a bunch of photos, stitched them together, and got a high resolution photo here. And then I could use some acid and strip off the metal so you can see the silicon underneath. And you get these kind of wild color effects because the oxide layer, sometimes you get different thicknesses. You get like you know, basically diffraction or you know, thin film color effects. So it looks a lot more pretty after you take the take the metal off. So now, now this um, chip used a technology called NMOS. Um, that was um, sort of the technology that was used by all your classic CPUs, the Z80, 6502, 68000. So I'll go into a little more detail of how that worked. So an MOS transistor, for our purposes, you can think of it as basically a switch between the source and the drain. Um, you, you have conducting diffusion regions of silicon with this insulating with this channel in between that keeps current from flowing. Um, but when you put a, a current on the gate, the, the field allows current to flow between the source and the drain, so it basically closes the switch. Now the gate is made out of a special type of silicon called polysilicon, and the polysilicon forms another layer of wiring that lies between the, the silicon underneath and the metal on top. So this is what it looks like when you look on the die photo. Now, as you can see, it's a lot simpler than, a, than an NPN transistor. We basically just have the source, the drain, and then that um, yellow polysilicon line for the gate. So whenever you see polysilicon crossing between um, two, two diffusion regions, you get a transistor. Then that circle is a contact where it's con connection between the, the silicon layer and the, the metal layer. So what can we do with this? Um, we can make an inverter pretty easily. And we take a, an NMOS transistor and resistor. If we put a one in, the transistor turns on. That connects the output to ground, so we get a zero out. And then if we put a zero in, the transistor turns off, and the pull-up resistor pulls the output high, so we get a one. And here's how it looks on an actual die. Again, it's much, much smaller than a TTL inverter. The TTL inverter we saw had multiple transistors, multiple resistors, took up a lot of space. This is very compact. We, we have the input forming a transistor between ground and the output. And it turns out that the pull-up, it's not actually a resistor. It's a special transistor that works like a resistor, but it's smaller and basically better in every way. So now we can take two of these inverters. We put them together so the input of one is connected to the output of the other. We have one on top, one on bottom. So now we can use the wires to read out what's stored in here, or we can force a value into it. And like the flip-flops we saw before, it'll, it will be stable in either the one state or zero state. Whichever one is on will force the other one to stay off. So now what can we do with this? We add a couple more transistors in the select line. So that allows us to select this, this latch, or we can turn off those transistors and leave it isolated for storage. And then we can take a bunch of these and put them into an array. And now we have a whole bunch of storage. Each column is a register, and then each row is a bit of storage in that array. And then we can make it into a bigger array. So this, this here is the register stack of the 8087. It's just built out of these, these inverter circuits we saw. And so we have eight registers, each storing 80 bits. So you can see that even though this is a complex chip, its components are still, still built out of very simple circuits underneath. So now I'll move on to some more complex gates. Um, the NOR gate, it's pretty much like an inverter, except it has two inputs. If both inputs are off, the transistors are off, the tr resistor pulls the output high. If either input is high, the transistor turns on and pulls the output to ground. So here's how that looks on the die. We have our two transistors. We have ground connection at the bottom. 
Um, we have our pull-up transistor, and then we have an output. So it's a pretty simple circuit on the die. Um, next, we'll move on to something a little more unusual, exclusive NOR. Now, this, th this looks almost like the NOR gate, except instead of being connected to ground, the transistors are connected to the opposite inputs. And the effect of that is interesting. So if both inputs are zero, the transistors are off, and the output's pulled to one, just as before. If both inputs are one, the transistors turn on. But now, since we're not connected to ground underneath, we're connected to a, a high signal, the output stays high. And then finally, if we have one input on, one input off, the transistor turns on and pulls the output low through the, through the, other, through the other input. And then here's how that looks on the die. Um, we have our two transistors, A and B inputs, um, but now each, each input is used both as a gate and as a source. And then there was a metal wire that connected the two transistors together, um, but that, that was dissolved in the acid process, so I've just drawn it back in with a, you know, with a line. So, so why am I showing you these two gates? Um, well, because they're part of a one-bit adder. Here we can see the NOR gate, here the exclusive NOR, and there's a few more gates, inverters, and a multiplexer, and that gives you a simple full adder circuit. So now we can take 64 of these adders, put them on the chip, and that gives us a whole 64-bit adder. So here, here the red box indicates one of the adders. And so now we've you know, already figured out two fairly large parts of the chip. So stepping back, I'll talk a bit about what the chip is actually doing. So it expresses um, floating point numbers with a 64-bit fraction part, which is processed down here and a 15-bit exponent part, which is processed up here. So we saw the register storage over here. And so you might think that this floating point chip has like some super special uh, math circuitry, but really it doesn't. We have the 64-bit the um, adder that we saw before, and then there's a high-speed shifter, and those are the main components it uses. So um, multiplication, it's just shifts and adds. Division and square root shifts and subtracts, and then um, if you want to do trig your exponents, those use special algorithms called quartic, and again it's just shifts and adds combined with some constants that are stored over here. So um, all these algorithms are controlled by microcode on the chip. Um, you can see there's a fairly large microcode ROM in, in the middle of the chip. Now, now Intel had to do some special tricks to get that that ROM to fit on this chip, so I'll talk about that next. So in a, here's a detail of part of the, part of the ROM. Now in a normal um, ROM, you're storing ones and zeros, you're storing binary, you have a transistor for a one, no transistor for a zero, but in this ROM, it's very different. You're storing things in four different levels. You have, it's really quaternary numbers instead of binary numbers. So how does that work? So you can have either a, a small transistor, a medium transistor, a large transistor, or no transistor in each spot. So each spot, you can have four different values, four different levels, that corresponds to two bits. So that gives you roughly twice the density out of your, out of your ROM circuit. So the, the problem is that now, that now that you have these four voltage levels, you know, somehow you have to convert it back to binary. And that's the job of the comparator. So this is, this is an analog circuit that's inside this chip that you think of as a digital chip. And so what's happening here is you have your volt, one of your four voltage levels coming in. You have a reference voltage coming from above. The comparator decides which one is higher, and it gives you an output. And then if you have three of these comparators, you can now tell which of the four levels you have and convert that, convert that into a bit. So. For 16 bits, you need 48 comparators, so it takes up you know, a reasonable amount of space on the chip to have all those, those analog comparators, and that's one of the reasons why you don't quite get a 50% space savings out of this chip, more like 40%. So now I'm going to go back in time to Intel's first product, the 3101 RAM chip. Now this RAM chip was a 64-bit RAM, and when I say 64 bits, that's not like a 64-bit processor, that's like 64 bits is all you get on this RAM chip. 
and you'd pay almost $100 for it. So this was way too expensive to use for main memory, um, but it was used in m many computers like the Alto for register storage or anything where you need high speed. So now this chip, it has a ceramic package, but it has a, a lid on top made out of metal. So I can just take my trusty chisel, hit the lid, and it'll pop right off and expose the die underneath. So now we can zoom in and see the die and the bond wires in more detail. And you'll notice that the RAM ch chip has a very regular structure. It's um, you know, much more structured than, than most of the chips we look at. Um, under the microscope, we can see, see more details of the chip. And then we can strip off the acid. On the right, there's still a, little, still a bit of metal left. And then here, I've taken off all the metal. And you can now see the, the doped silicon that forms the transistors. So we can zoom in on this. Um, we can see the, the circuitry. Turns out to be um, two, two emitter transistors and some resistors at the top. So we can draw the schematic for that. And it turns out to be a lot like the other flip flops we saw, except here we have an extra emitter that we're using to select one row in the chip. And then we have um, data lines for reading and writing that go vertically. So here's the, our structure of the chip. At the top, we have four address lines coming in. We have 16 NAND gates to decode in the middle to pick one of the lines. Um, we have four storage cells in each row, two on each side. And at the bottom, we have some data lines for data coming in and output lines to read out the, the four bits. So a few years later, TI came out with an improved version of this chip, a 64-bit TTL RAM chip with the same pinout. Um, I got some die photos from Robert Barak, so I thought it'd be interesting to compare, see what changed between the Intel chip and this chip. You know, it should be basically the same structure, but with some improvements. But when I looked at the die photo, it's like, this doesn't look at all like the previous chip. There's like no grid of cells. What is going on here? This is so bizarre. Um, there's two small grids up at the top, but those don't really look like RAM. There's a, way more logic than you'd expect from a, a RAM chip. And the transistors, they look like CMOS, not TTL. So this is pretty weird. In the middle, I noticed a resistor network, had resistors of R size and 2R. Um, R or 2R sounded familiar. I looked on um, Wikipedia. That turns out to be a common um, eight digital to analog circuit. So why, is it, why are there two digital to analog converters on this chip? And then I looked at the ROM. I looked at the ROM. Um, if you look closely, you can actually read out the, the zeros and the ones that are stored on the chip. When you do that, it turns out there's a four-bit sine wave encoded in each ROM. OK, this is not a memory chip. Something very weird is going on. So I thought for a while, why would a chip be generating digitally two different sine waves? Sound synthesis, kind of weird. And then I thought, touch tone phone. Now, if you've used old touch tone phones, each button press it generates two tones, one for the row, one for the column. Originally, these used a bunch of um, analog oscillators. But then in 1975, MOSTEC came out with a, an IC that would digitally generate it. So it, it took a high frequency signal, divided that down to the frequency you wanted, and then generated your two tones. Now, this looks like a strange frequency, but it turns out to be um, the magic frequency used by color TVs for their color burst. So the, these crystals were made in huge quantities for every TV, so they're very cheap, so they got used by a lot of different circuits, such as the, the touchtone phone. So anyway, I compared the die photo with the touchtone phone schematic. Everything seemed to match up. So it turns out that this thing that was advertised as a memory chip was actually a touchtone chip. So apparently somebody is like taking Touchtone chips, repackaging them, and selling them as counterfeit memory chips on eBay. Now, th these are cheap chips, so it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense as, as far as counterfeiting plots go, but you know, there you go. So an anyway, Robert talked to the, the seller and told him that you know, this was not the chip he had bought. And the seller said, oh, it must have been damaged in shipping, so I'll, I'll refund your money. <laughs> so anyway. This is the end of my talk. I've explained um, you know, how you can open up chips, how you can look inside, how you can understand them. But if the most important thing to remember here is if you send chips, package them carefully, or they might get damaged and turn into touchstone chips. <laughs> Thank you.